so nice to see so many people in church and have it bustling with activity like it's been this morning. I know there's a lot going on, but it seems like the energy of Christmas has kick-started the year, and uh, I pray that we carry that momentum forward into the new year. So thank you for being here. Welcome, everyone, um, to Standish Congregational Church on another sunny Sunday. Uh, we've lucked out a lot with our Sundays. They've been um, lovely uh, to experience. And if you're visiting, welcome. Uh, whether you're here in person or welcome to the Zoom audience as well. Um, if, uh, if, you're, if you have questions about our church, please see myself or one of the deacons and join us after the service for refreshments in the fellowship hall. We are an open and affirming church. Whoever you are, wherever you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. So thank you for being here this morning. We continue our theme of renewal this, this Sunday with the Epiphany the baptism of Jesus, and uh, we'll make it official as uh, later on in the service we'll hold an affirmation of ministry for your new interim minister. Please join Will Hamilton in the call to worship. Good morning. The prophet Isaiah spoke of God's servant in whom God would delight. We are God's servants, filled with God's spirit. Without making a lot of fuss, without complaint, God's servant will work steadily for justice. We are God's servants, filled with God's spirit. God's servant is to be a light shining for all the world, to bring healing and hope and freedom to all of God's people. Of God, let us worship God. Let us join together in our hymn of praise, the church's one foundation, number 238. Once again, welcome. It's lovely to see everyone here today. Um, I'll draw your attention to the insert with announcements. 
Um, several things to uh, pay attention to here. Um, does anyone want to call anything out specifically from the announcement sheet? Michelle? So Saturday, January 21st, will be our annual meeting. It is the time we do our annual reports and do business for the church. All friends and members are welcome to attend and encouraged to attend. And at 6 o'clock before the meeting, we will be having a potluck supper in the fellowship hall. So I hope to see you all there. And please bring your own um, plates and flatware so we don't have people crashing around in the kitchen um, while we're having our meeting. <laughs> Uh, the Caring Connection um, meeting last week was canceled because of the snow, so we're meeting after church in the small uh, conference room. That's the Caring Connection group. Thank you. I just want to um, bring your attention. Oh, geez, I'm sick. I bring your <laughs> um, bring your attention to the um, uh, chili and chowder on. Uh, February 12th, so these are part of your goodies that will be there. Um, speak into the box. Um, anyway, uh, there'll be other things around that, to, that give you hints of what will be there. Anyway, be there. Thank you. Super Bowl Sunday, February 12th. Anyone else have any announcements? Let us join our hearts to more intentionally to worship as we join in the opening prayer. And uh, I want to invite you at the end of each stanza, it says, and we cry, I'd like you all to say glory. We'll see where that occurs. Please join me in prayer. When we clasp the past tight to our fading memories, you come, glory of creation to strip us bare of all pride and pretense with your future, to slip the latch on the fears and worries that keep us bound from following you, to stand with us when death and sin try to bully us, and we cry, Glory. When our faith flickers in the shadows of chaos, you come, servant of all, to be the grace crier through the streets of our hearts, to teach eager students the songs of peace and hope, to open eyes heavy-lidded by indifference, and we cry, Glory. When we are dubious about being disciples, you come, baptism's spirit, to journey with peace walkers through the world's violent streets, to strengthen us when we are bent by doubt, to anoint us with rivers of grace, hope, and reconciliation. And we cry, glory. Amen.
and Katie. really appreciate that. I'd like to have Sawyer go into action and um, Sierra and Amelia come up. So today I brought, what is this? A dove, right. Uh, one of the early stories in our Bible is the story of Noah and the great flood that covered the earth. After 40 long days, the rain stopped and Noah and his family were very happy. The flood waters would soon start to go down. But after more time went by, they began wondering if they would ever see land again. So Noah sent out a dove, and when the dove returned with an olive leaf in its beak, the family knew that land had started to appear again. The dove with the leaf in its beak was a sign of a new beginning, and they knew that God was with them. One of today's lectionary readings that we actually won't be hearing is the story of Jesus' baptism and how a dove was also a special messenger for him of God's love. Doves are special symbols in our church as they remind us that God's spirit is with us too. Doves are signs of peace and love and baptism. When we see them, and here it comes, we remember that the Holy Spirit, God's spirit, is always present with us. And Joe, what you can plant that now, Sawyer. Um, <laughs> we wanted to bring it out today this is a special time. This is a time of a new beginning. This is a sign that God is with us, and especially with Dave today on his uh, investiture. So um, we brought it out and showed it to everybody. Let us pray. Thank you, God, for loving me. Thank you for reminding us about doves. Doves are a special sign of a new beginning. Be with us and Dave on our own new beginning. Thank you, God, for loving everybody. Amen. Thank you, Mary Lou, and I will be talking about Jesus' baptism, actually. <laughs> Uh, please remain seated as we sing our hymn of approach, Lord, speak to me that I may speak, number 356.
Our scripture reading this morning is from uh, the book of Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah. And uh, I, I like to provide some Old Testament context sometimes, even when we're talking about uh, New Testament uh, passages. But in the passage that Will is about to read, Isaiah describes the servant of the Lord. His hearers at the time would have interpreted this passage to be referring to the nation of Israel as the servant of the Lord. But Jesus claims this as one of the prophecies about himself. Today is designated Baptism of Christ Sunday, and I will be speaking about that event in my meditation. By submitting to be baptized himself, Jesus is modeling the obedience of a servant of God. Please listen as Will reads the passage from Isaiah. This morning's scripture reading is from Isaiah chapter 42, verses 1 through 9. Here is my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen, in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break, and a dimly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not grow faint or be crushed until he has established justice in the earth. And the coastlands wait for his teaching. Thus says God, the Lord, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and what comes from it, who gives breath to the Lord, who gives breath to the people upon it, and spirit to those who walk in it. I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I have taken you by the hand and kept you. I have given you a covenant to the people, a light to the nations, to open the eyes that are blind, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from the prison those who sit in darkness. I am the Lord. That is my name. My glory I give to no other, nor my praise to idols. See, the former things have come to pass, and new things I now declare. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. Thus ends today's reading. Will you please pray with me? Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts and minds be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. This past Friday was the traditional date of Epiphany. We think of Epiphany as being a kind of an aha moment of realization, like a great idea coming to your mind, or you suddenly solve a stubborn problem, or perhaps Hercule Poirot finding the precise clue that unlocks a mystery. See what I did there? But in our context, the word Epiphany refers to a re revelation from God, or a manifestation of God in our world. In most traditions, Epiphany commemorates the day the Magi from the East finally arrived to give their gifts to the Christ child. The visitors were guided by a light in the sky, a form of revelation itself, and that light led them not to a king, or at least not what they expected a king to be. They were led to a child. Now, we don't know how long their journey took, so Jesus may have been an infant, but he may already have been a toddler. In any case, he was not in the typical status of kingship. So what was the revelation that God had for these visitors? In Matthew's account, these magi or astrologers or learned people were guided not only by a light, but also by a prophecy. They were up to date on their Bible reading plans. They were familiar with the prophet Micah, who wrote in the mid to late eighth century BC. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. So they had an idea what they were looking for. But instead of a king on a throne, they found the unexpected. Instead of presuming they had been misdirected and turning back toward their homes, what did they do? In one of the earliest acts of faith, directed toward the person of Jesus. They were overwhelmed with joy. They knelt down and paid him homage. They opened their treasure chests and presented their gifts. They realized 
that Jesus was more than a human child, they quickly received the revelation that Jesus was a manifestation of the divine. But there's something else hinted at in this narrative, and per God's MO, it's somewhat of a surprise. You see, these learned visitors, although they were students of the Hebrew scriptures, they were not Jews. We can speculate as to whether as a result of this epiphany, perhaps they studied more closely and learned more about the God of the Hebrews, Yahweh, and the ongoing story of redemption that the Jewish people were part of. But they were not, strictly speaking, Jews. The adoration of the Magi is arguably the first outward manifestation of God's plan to bring salvation, to bring redemption to all people. Yes, as part of his ministry, Jesus as an adult would preach to non-Jews on occasion. He certainly healed people of all walks of life, including the child of a Roman soldier. We think of the Apostle Paul on his missionary journeys outside of Palestine to be the first to bring the message of God to the Gentiles. But here, nestled between the birth narrative and the proper beginning of Jesus' adult ministry, here we see that the Magi were the first to illustrate that Jesus was for all people, that his message was not simply for one selective group. Fast forward now to Jesus' adulthood. His public ministry begins with a visit to his cousin John, who is performing ritual cleansing ceremonies in the Jordan River. I'd like to read the five verses from Matthew chapter 3, which are part of the lectionary readings for this Sunday, which Mary Lou so thoughtfully teased for me. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. And John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and you are coming to me? But Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it to be so for now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he allowed him. When he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So here we have another epiphany, a manifestation of the holiness, the otherness of Jesus. John seems to know, as if by revelation, that Jesus is not in need of baptism in the sense of cleansing. And we don't know whether the descending of a spirit like a dove or the audible voice from heaven were seen and heard by others. The three synoptic gospels all seem to indicate that he, Jesus, experienced these manifestations. And some commentaries suggest that perhaps John did as well. We don't know definitively that others in the crowd saw or heard anything out of the ordinary. But based on what I know about why the gospel accounts were written, we can suppose some things to be true. We know that at least a few of Jesus' followers had been disciples of John's. Andrew, the brother of Simon Peter, and probably Philip. And they would undoubtedly have been present for this manifestation. And because the gospels were intended to be persuasive documents, the writers would have wanted their descriptions to be corroborated by others. So a case can be made that others were awed by the sight and sound of a manifestation of God. But I want you to notice something else, something that's not explicitly called out in the text. Who is present as part of this manifestation or epiphany? God, the creator, the father who proclaims, this is my beloved son. Jesus, the Christ, the son of God, and the Holy Spirit, alighting upon Jesus like a peace-bringing dove. The Trinity shows up, visibly or audibly, to endorse the new ministry upon which Jesus will now embark. And like a punctuation mark, John the baptizer vocalizes what all of this means. It's not recorded in Matthew's account, but in the Apostle John's Gospel, John the baptizer, different John, declares, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John was the first to proclaim the unexpected role of the Messiah, that of Lamb, not of warrior, 
of peacemaker, not of soldier, of sacrifice and suffering, not of wealth and power. John's baptism was a ritual, a, a symbol. There was nothing mystical or magical about it. It didn't literally cleanse people from their sin. It's an outward expression of an inward truth, of a commitment that the person had made. The people of Israel sinned and rebelled. They were still, in first century Palestine, they were still worshiping idols. Now, it was a different kind of idolatry. They weren't, in most cases, in most cases they weren't uh, worshiping graven images or statues. But many of them, particularly the Jewish leadership, had might, made an idol of the law. They'd gotten away from the core message of God's love and care for all creation, embodied in Deuteronomy and in other places in Hebrew scripture, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So in baptism, John was calling on the people to repent, to acknowledge they were going down the wrong path, and turn to God, literally change their mind, and go a different direction. Israel sinned and rebelled, but they continue to serve God's purposes. Baptism is a confirmation of a commitment to a God-centered life. For us, baptism continues that pattern. We are broken people, called to repentance to change our ways. In Jesus' baptism, he sought to identify himself with people in need of repentance and redemption. Our baptism, again, doesn't magically wash away our sins. Jesus has done that for us. But it publicly declares to the world whose we are. It's an outward expression of the inward commitment that we have made to a God-centered life. Despite our sin and rebellion, God can still use us in working out his holy plan. So in this season of Epiphany, let us remember that the Christ child has come. Let us marvel at his presence as the Magi did, following the light in the sky to try and find the light of the world. Let us share the revelation that God has shared with us, that the Son of God has come to set all free from sin. I'd like to close with a poetic quote from the theologian and activist Howard Thurman. When the song of angels is stilled, when the star in the sky is gone, when the kings and princes are home, when the shepherds are back with their flocks, the work of Christmas begins to find the lost, to heal the broken, to feed the hungry, to release the prisoner, to rebuild the nations, to bring peace among people, and to make music in the heart. Amen. God is still speaking. God is always listening. Let us lift up to God the joys and concerns of our hearts. Hi, um, I'd like prayers for the family of Visha Dinesh. She came to this country about 20 years ago um, as a bride from an arranged marriage from India. She and her husband had a very successful marriage. She became a physician um, in Chevy Chase, um, Washington. They had uh, two beautiful children um, I, I know her husband just adores her. She's 44, and she died last week. She and I had breast cancer at the same time, but she had the BRCA gene. I did not. So prayers for the family of Visha Dinesh. Um, I'd like to do prayers for um, the family and friends of Deb Silver. 
Deb Silver was an icon and just one of the most important people in the Bonnie Eagle community. Um, she was a bus driver, but oh, so much more. And she, I think, knew everyone. And I said, when I was on the school board, there's one person who always says, hi, Deb. That's anyone who's in the room, because the whole community knew her. And she passed away unexpectedly. Um, and then prayers for her son, Alex, as well. But she will be, there was none like her. And I'll say one more thing about Deb was that um, I heard at a meeting the other night she started the backpack program at the Bonnie Eagle School for filling backpacks with food years and years and years ago and started that program because she saw kids coming to school who were hungry on her buses. So she will be terribly missed. I'm asking prayers for um, Sue. Molly, um, her sister died yesterday, so uh, prayers for her also. And I have my cousin's grandson is um, having a heart valve replacement, and he's just a freshman in college and will have to leave school for that. And prayers for him also. I'm just real happy that we're all here and for this occasion. Eric, any requests on Zoom? Um, so I was given a book for Christmas by Bono, who in case you, anyone doesn't know, is a singer from the rock band U2. Uh, he's also a pretty devout Christian, uh, peace activist, so I started reading this, and in this particular chapter, he kind of explains how he's never really been a member of any church because he's very wary of churchiness versus Christianity. Um, and, you know, he said a lot of supposed Christians are just churchy. They go to church, they pray, they say blessings at food, but they don't really live or regard the teachings of Christ. And it really struck a chord with me. So I thought it would be nice if we all tried to be more Christian and less churchy this year. <laughs> well, please join me in prayer. I will say a brief pastoral prayer um, after a few moments of silence, and then we'll close with the Lord's Prayer. So please pray silently. God of every epiphany, help us to remember that we begin every journey drenched in your love. Our identity, being, and calling begins and ends and begins again with you. We thank you for the day-to-day -day revelations you give us, O oh God, in the quiet moments when we see you in the sunrise or the rhythmic falling of ocean waves, in the joyous celebrations of our hearts. May we remember you and all you've done for us. In our dark moments, remind us of your presence, of your promise, and empower us to comfort others in our lives in their moments of darkness. Loving God, we lift up those in our community, in our family of faith, in our family of community, who are pillars of the community and who are doing important work. So many people who are taken from us and we miss the work that they're doing. Let it inspire us to continue our own work and help us to 
to have comfort knowing that your plans cannot be thwarted, but bring peace and a sense of your presence to those who are grieving, particularly the families of Yisha Dinesh and of Sufali's sister Nina and the family and friends and all those who were touched by Deb Silver. Lord, we lift up people whose faith is put forth publicly and can inspire others to live lives more closely modeled on Jesus and less concerned with ceremony. We lift up people like Bono who put their faith in the public arena. And we thank you for those people. We also thank you for the continuing recovery of Damar Hamlin. May his recovery continue and bring joy to our hearts and let this moment of crisis reinforce in all our hearts the power of prayer to bring comfort and faith to a world searching for answers. We lift up all those who are ill and who are struggling with injury, disease, Lift up Kim's cousin's grandson. Ask you to get him through his health crisis. Loving God, I thank you for this congregation, for the support they've provided over this year of transition, and for encouraging my ministry here in Standish. Bless all of our efforts to bring your word, your peace, your justice, and your love to this community. All these things we lift up in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. This congregation has been so generous with its time, with its talent, and with its treasures. We've not yet resumed the practice of passing the offering plate, but if you have something to give, please drop it in the plate as you leave this morning. But as you hear Katie play the offertory, just be in prayer about how you can continue to support the work of this church and this ministry in Standish. join me in the prayer of dedication. By your grace, God of the waters, we can open our eyes 
to see those in need around us. By your abundance in our lives, what we offer can bring hope and healing to more people than we can ever imagine. By your blessing, others are invited to the waters of life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Before we venture into the order of affirmation of ministry, it seems appropriate to restate our statement of faith as part of the new year and as part of the dedication of a new ministry. So uh, please join me in reading the UCC statement of faith, which is found on your insert. It's also in the hymnal on page S4 if, uh, if you don't have an insert handy. We believe in you, O God, eternal spirit, God of our Savior, Jesus Christ, and our God, and to your deeds we testify. You call the worlds into being, create persons in your own image, and set before each the ways of life and death. You seek in holy love to save all people from aimlessness and sin. You judge people and nations by your righteous will, declared through prophets and apostles. In Jesus Christ, the man of Nazareth, our crucified and risen Savior, you have come to us and shared our common lot, conquering sin and death and reconciling the world to yourself. You bestow upon us your Holy Spirit, creating and renewing the Church of Jesus Christ, binding in covenant faithful people of all ages, tongues, and races. You call us into your church to accept the cost and joy of discipleship, to be your servants in the service of others, to proclaim the gospel to all the world and resist the powers of evil, to share in Christ's baptism and eat at his table, to join him in his passion and victory. You promise to all who trust you forgiveness of sins and fullness of grace, courage in the struggle for justice and peace, your presence in trial and rejoicing, and eternal life in your realm, which has no end. Blessing and honor, glory and power, be unto you. Amen. Thank you. And now I'd like to invite Mary Lou, our moderator, representatives from the deacons, the trustees, and the missions board, and our consultant in ministry, Reverend Sally Colgrove, to come forward. Please step to the lectern uh, when, when it's your turn to, to read. Affirmation of ministry is the act whereby a local church of the United Church of Christ recognizes the diverse gifts of its members and celebrates the particular ministry of each person in the life of the church or in various settings in the world. Please join in the responsive reading in your, in your bulletin. There are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same spirit gives them. There are different ways of serving, but the same God is served. There are different abilities to perform service, but the same God gives ability to each of us for our particular service. The spirit's presence is shown in some way in each person for the good of all. Christ is like a single body which has many parts. It is still one body, even though it is made up of different parts. If one part of the body suffers, 
all the other parts suffer with it. If one part is praised, all the other parts share its happiness. All of us are Christ's body, and each one is part of it. I'm going to step off the script for just a minute. I have to say that um, I am extremely grateful and pleased that Dave has chosen to step up to the plate here. And because of that, I am very encouraged and extremely optimistic about what lies in front of this church. Now back to the script here. David has been called by God in accordance with the faith and order of this church to serve among us as our interim minister. He has accepted this call and is before us in wit and is before us in witness to his willingness to serve. Sisters and brothers in Christ, it is an honor to be entrusted with responsibility for particular service in the ministry of the church, whether gathered or scattered. According to the bylaws of Standish Congregational Church, the minister's responsibilities include the spiritual welfare of the congregation through the preaching of the word, development and leadership of public worship, and the administering of the sacraments, as well as the role of teacher and counselor to members of the congregation and of the community. Having prayerfully considered the duties and responsibilities of your ministry, are you prepared to serve with the help of God in Christ's name and for the glory of God? Do you promise to exercise your ministry diligently and faithfully showing forth the love of Christ. I do, relying on God's grace. At this time, I would ask um, Marcia Charles, who is a representative from the Cumberland Association, the chair of the Church and Ministry uh, Committee, to come and join us here as well. She'll be leading us in the prayer. Members of this household of faith, you have heard the promise of our brother in Christ who has answered God's call to service. Let us affirm our intention to live in covenant with him. Will those who are able rise and witness to the commitment we now make? We gather in celebration of the joy that is ours to be partners with you in the service of Jesus Christ. We promise to love you, honor your leadership, and assist you that together we may be a faithful church of Jesus Christ. You may be seated. If you get to go off script, then I do too, right? This is an exciting day for you. And the most exciting part is this is Holy Spirit stuff and the Cumberland Association are looking so forward to walking with you all, but especially with you, David, as we begin this journey together. Let us pray together. Eternal God, you have called David to serve you in this household of faith and in the world, which you have entrusted to our care and keeping. Send your Holy Spirit on him that he may serve among us with honor and faithfulness. Help him to be diligent in his duties that our church may prosper in the mission of your place before it. May his example prove worthy for all of us to follow as we are united in Christ's ministry to the glory of your name. Amen. In the name of Jesus Christ, and on behalf of the people of Standish Congregational Church, United Church of Christ, I rejoice to announce you are installed as interim minister. 
As a sign to us and to the wider world of your commitment to ministry and service, we present you this robe of ministry. This robe is a Geneva preaching gown, which is the historic symbol of the learned ministry, representing the academic, academic study, which leads one toward ministry and eventual ordination. I think I've said a lot over the past several weeks, months, uh, about how grateful I am that this congregation has supported me in this endeavor, and uh, I pray that the momentum will continue, and uh, I look forward to serving all of you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Sierra went out to ring the bell. I don't know if... <laughs> Wait for it. <laughs> Maybe she rang it while we clapped. <laughs> she thought I was going to make a longer speech. <laughs> As Sierra rings the bell, our hymn of dedication is called As Partners in Christ's Service, number 353. Do not be dismayed by the brokenness in the world. All things break and all things can be mended. Not with time as they say, but with intention. So go, 
Love intentionally, extravagantly, unconditionally. The broken world waits in darkness for the light that is you. Amen.